good morning everybody uh, welcome to the um, parallel session uh, we have uh, uh, dr herbert shovel um, he needs no introduction he is very popular among tibetan or soric medicine uh, to present uh, uh, on the topic Sohorukpa, its development in modern pharmaceutics. So I give the uh, floor to the doctor. So thank you for the introduction. Hello, everybody. It's interesting to speak, uh, first of all, here in Sarnat, after I visited Sarnat uh, quite some time ago. And also, we had just before from Dr. Dorji Rapten the introduction about autoimmune disease and actually on the parallel session from Tenzin Chodon there's a talk which actually would fit very well together with, with my talk so we have this in parallel now so we have to feel also the lecture from below what we what I want to present you and, and my idea that I want to present you is action profiles of Tibetan formulas which in other words could mean how can we understand Tibetan formulas from the perspective of Western science. And this applies not only to Tibetan formulas, but of course also to the many other Asian type of formulas. So the idea is really to make a link here between tradition and science. It is not as many believe that old traditions, old knowledge has no meaning even in a scientific way, in a modern scientific way. It is also not just kind of a story, but sometimes we have really to look deep what can it mean to have traditional knowledge? What can it mean in a scientific way? But on the other hand, from the point of view of science, we have also to understand that science has also its limitations and also its philosophical basics and maybe if we understand those two things first and then we can understand or maybe try to link both of these worlds so that's basically the idea i'm here in sarnat so i don't need to explain you a lot or anything even anything about the basics of tibetan medicine um, just to remind you that this concept of the elements is also a concept as we that we had also in the ancient Europe, of course. Also, there were the elements before the scientific revolution, around which started around 1600. Uh, so, before this time, in the medieval times, also we in Europe had, of course, these few of the elements that the nature, the cosmos, is compounded of these elements. So, it is now. For us in Europe, when I went to school, I was taught that this is ancient, this is outdated knowledge, actually. So when I started then to learn physics, because I, I actually was trained in, in physics, in quantum physics, so I learned even more that this is outdated. So I had to rediscover this for me, and especially when I worked more with Tibetan medicine, I had to rediscover this kind of knowledge, what is what can we understand still, or what can we make of this ancient uh, knowledge? And it becomes more complicated even, as you know, then we have, of course, uh, the three moving principles and the five elements. But then what is interesting then, and now we come more to pharmaceutics, is that the tastes are connected to the elements, to the energies. And when we see and compare this again to modern pharmaceutics, to modern medicine, I think when you talk about allopathic medicine, nobody talks what is the taste of aspirin, what is the taste and smell of cortisone. There we talk about molecules. How do they act, these molecules? But in traditional knowledge, we know that these tastes together they make actually they are an indicator of the effectiveness of the plants so this is again something we have to consider that actually we are talking here about the with the different sense organs in our body we have the eyes the ears 
the nose, the tongue and the touch. But exactly those two sense organs that are the most important for Tibetan medicine are excluded from science. Modern science does not talk about taste and smell. At least if you read a textbook of modern pharmaceutics, as I explained, cortisone, you will not find this has a pungent taste or has a funny smell or anything. You just hear about this mode of action. And this is basically quite a contradiction if you want to talk to modern scientists because they say, oh, you talk about impressions that are not part of, the, of modern science. Modern science is, reduces us mainly to the visual inspection with all the tools that we have, microscopes, chromatographs, and so on, all these measuring devices, some um, sound uh, mode, some sound uh, activity, of course. We have this echo, uh, sonographs, son sonographic methods, and, of course, touch but no taste and smell. So how to reconcile this and how to understand this, this is definitely a, a very difficult question. And it becomes more complicated, as you know, the Tibetan formulas are multi-compound mixtures, 3, 10, 20, even more different plants, herbs and minerals are mixed together to compound one formula. So. This, again, is one of, of the problems that we see because Western science, and I will explain this shortly, wants to reduce everything. So how can we understand it? Just a remark here. I've written here mainly plants and minerals. We will have other lectures on precious materials and so on. Just a comment here. Also, when you work especially in, in the Western context, in Europe or the United States, we have, of course, uh, it's very difficult to talk from the legal perspective about precious materials, but that would be a different lecture that would be needed to explain this deeper. So this is actually now the prerequisite we are talking about. This is this kind of the, the setup. So now let's ask the question, what is now the problem of Western science with this ancient, with this Tibetan formulas? We could also extend this to Ayurveda, to Chinese medicine and so on. So one, of course, is, and here we have, of course, when we talk about modern science, I mean, of course, biomedicine, pharmaceutics. This is the basis of modern medical thinking. And here are some basic scientific principles, like cause and effect. That means we have to reduce everything to a cause and effect chain. Actually, Buddhist thinking is very close to this. And I think this is also one of the reasons why His Holiness the Dalai Lama is ex expecting so much from the dialogue with science, because this is a very Buddhist thinking. But there is another principle of science which is not so favorable for Tibetan medicine, and this is reductionism. Reductionism was invented a long time ago. I just remind you, this was actually a monk, a Christian monk who invented this in the, around 1200, 1300, William of Ockham. We have there a saying, this is Ockham's razor. So he cuts every problem as long as it is simplified. Just that we have, can answer a simple question. And just for you, because uh, we are here talking about Tibetan medicine, we should not forget that was actually a time when also Tibetan medicine was actually doing one of the big advances, uh, advances at that time because uh, Yutok Yonten Gompo, the younger way, was actually almost at the same time. So in, the, in Europe, it was at that time that we in invented this reductionism. And what does this mean? Reductionism means we have to reduce everything to the simplest cause. And what is the simplest cause in a plant? And everybody knows this because when you, whenever you are in contact with a Western scientist, what is the question that you get? What is the active principle? What is the active molecule? And then usually from Tibetan science we have to say, oh, we don't know. There are so many compounds in there. We don't simply know how to do it. And this is the reason why they ask it. 
because of this reductionism, not because of the cause and effect. Here we would be in full alignment. So the next question is how to reduce complexity. At least we in Europe very often get so we, uh, the question, you have now five plants in the formula. Can you not leave out four of them? Just make one. Can you not leave out in the plant what is the active? Can we not purify this? Can we not make a molecule out of it, a white powder? And if you say, no, this is not the right thing, I want to preserve actually the full, uh, the full uh, spectrum, the full uh, composition of, of this. Then they say, but then it's so complicated to work with this. How can we work with this? This is then actually a question, and when I tell you, it's also important to regard the taste and smell of this formula, <laughs> then they say, oh, now we lost you. We, do, we, do, we cannot work with this. So this is basically all the scientific literature that is mainly produced today. Here, just one example. I don't want to go into the de detail, but I just as an example, you see lots and lots of papers are produced today. Here about the cinnamons of Shinta. It's just a publication which talks about the composition, antimicrobial activity, cytotoxic, all this knowledge, this, the reductionist knowledge of this plant. When they have this knowledge, they ask you, why do you mix this up with others? We know about here, it's also already antimicrobial. Maybe, as we had the lecture before, autoimmune. It's already acting on autoimmune diseases. Why do you mix other components? Why do you talk about hot and cold properties and so on? This is actually the problem. And then also you see the many, many single component products that are on the market. When you then see, this is very simple, that's, I googled just uh, cinnamon again, and you have, uh, when you look at the pictures, a lot of cinnamon single component products. When you look for multi-component products, according to tradition, this the market value. We had yesterday the talk of Stefan. The market value of these component mixtures is much less. And even some of the companies of Ayurveda and of Tibetan and Chinese medicine now change their attitude. And that was also very clear yesterday that they shift their attitude towards single product, uh, single component products. So. I think this is also a threat because they say, no, this is so effective and why should we use this ancient knowledge? So that's my question here. So how to bring this together? How to bring actually this old wisdom, this old knowledge, how to reconcile it, maybe how to make an interface with modern science and that's basically the idea. Briefly, I want to explain now. It's not a, I can only start to to give you an idea. And one of these is already, st let's first look back to one plant. I think you know this plant quite well. Already this is a multi-component. Already the in there are many different, so when you look from a chemical analytic point of view, again, you cut it into pieces and look deeper and deeper, you find many, many molecules in this one plant. Mainly these are the, the herb, the, the, the adstringent substances, anti-inflammatory activity, antioxidant activity. So it's a very strong healing capacity is, is present in, uh, in the mirobalan. So it's really phenolic compounds. So we can today identify to low amount, the lowest amounts even in one, in one uh, single herb. You can do this now for any herb of Tibetan medicine. But more interesting is it now to look in a whole mixture. But then we don't talk about, already in the single plant we talked about many, but now we talk about 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 different compounds. And immediately we see that this is not the way to proceed because we now have to make a catalog of 100,000 different substances. So how can this, this work out? So we have to go or more to the action. What do these plants, what do the substances in the plant do? What, what actually are they doing? And when we look at this, we have to look at from a systemic point of view. 
we have to look on the different levels that we see from modern science in the human body. So we see from the modern science that the human body, on top, we have the physiologic level. That is the general level of the composition and the action of the body as a whole. Then we have the organ level. Then we have the cellular level. Of course, this is now, we are leaving now the, the level what traditional knowledge tells us, because I think we can find some similarities, but you know that only the cellular level was discovered, at least in the West, after the invention of the microscope. So we see now, we go now down even deeper. And as I said to you, now Tenzin Chodom below is uh, on lecture hall one, uh, lecture hall A is now talking about the genetic level, the genes. So the cells, the, uh, we have here the genetic level, system biology, that means all the biological processes in the cell. So these are the four different levels we are working with. And from tradition, we get the message that, uh, so we have to link all those levels. That is the task that we have to do. But from, uh, so we did this, and I give you here one example, and it fits very well with the autoimmune network. I gave you, I give here you another example. This is the network of functions of the immune system during atherosclerosis. It's the hardening of the, of the arteries. This is also, one could say, an autoimmune disease because it is actually linked to an inflammation of the, of the arteries. And this, we did several research work on this level. So we, this is now immune level. And I come back to this. The immune level is the lowest level because this is below the cells. These are molecules flowing in the blood. So the antigens, antibodies, this is actually the action of the lowest level here. But of course, it affects the upper level. So we did some research here, and I can tell you, and this is just a reminder what uh, the formula Gabor that we do, where we did the most research work in Switzerland, and you see on the different aspects of this immune network where we have single interactions. It's not in this network. All this is then proven by scientific work that here this formula has activity. So that's, for me, this is fascinating. This was fascinating because how can even that you can prove even on a, on a cellular, subcellular level where, the, where actually the old scriptures, no, nobody talked about this, but still it has activity even on this level. Now a short reminder here, there is a sign here, just that you know. Uh, we have this year the 40 year, uh, it's not a golden jubilee, but I think also 40 years we are working with this formula already in Switzerland, totally. Our company is already working 50 years. We have next year the 50 year celebration of working with Tibetan medicine, Tibetan formulas in, in Switzerland, which is quite some time. This just as a short reminder that, that that, of course, is also important for us. So the Swiss people really know already, the Swiss doctors, I think they have already some familiarity with Tibetan formulas. When we start working with this formula Gabur, the first translations of the, of the activity were actually traditional. So we talked about heat disorders, poisons, removal of poisons, uh, kind of regenerative uh, activities, and so on. These were the first reports we got. And then we started to group them. And again, you see here, that we have on the one aspect, we have this aspect of silent inflammation. We could now translate, I already tell you the, in an essence that this we relate to the hidden fever. It's a very modern topic now, very prominent now, silent inflammation. I think this is a big chance for also for Tibetan medicine to talk about hidden fever and silent inflammation. Only in the last five to 10 years, Western science developed this, pro this idea of silent inflammation. Then, of course, there are other aspects strengthening the immune system. Again, coming back to this autoimmune idea. We have a lot of uh, even strength, uh, like uh, the many activities that a formula can have is especially when it's anti-inflammatory, because this is the basis of so many diseases. 
And the third one is improving the circulation, even the circulation in the small vessels, which, which then helps to uh, feed the tissue. Because if the circulation is better, the nutrients can come better to the tissue. So we have here already a kind of a Western description and a more traditional description. So when we put this all together for this one formula, just as an example for the formula Gabor 25, we can put this all together. We see the action on the different levels of the organism. From the top, the whole body has a better circular, the benefits of a better circulation. On the organ level, we know it affects the blood system. On the cellular level, we know it's anti-inflammatory. And on the lowest level, we know we have this immune system, the inflammation, where it works on the genetic level. And I think this is the main aspect of my talk, actually, and the main essence I want to give you. When we look on all this together, we can build a bridge between the tradition, the traditional system, traditional knowledge, and the modern knowledge. But we have to look at all the different levels together. It will not be possible, that's my idea or my message, it is not possible just to look at one and say, oh, here we only look at the inflammation at one part and then link this to tradition. We have to see it in a way of holistic. And this is the praxis of holistic, to see the whole system in all different levels. And of course, to see the different action on the different levels. This would be, if we have this description, I'm dreaming now of all the formulas that we know the activity, then we have an interface between tradition and the modern. And I think tradition says something. We just have to translate it. We have uh, moving the lung in the, in the body that could, one could relate to the circulation, the hidden fever to the blood system, and the cooling the tripper on the cellular level. Of course, this is not a one-to-one -one identity, but just to give you an idea how to start thinking about formulas on this systemic level. And this then could make it possible, and this is our experience in Switzerland, this is then the starting point of a dialogue with Western medicine. Because suddenly this is a language they understand. They say, oh, yeah, it's clear. This is there, this is on this level, this is on that level. So it is not just talking, them. yes, it's active. You have to be more specific, and it is possible. Of course, it's a starting work, but this is one of the ideas. And finally, and this is then already to, to, show, to come to the end, if we look at such a network, that we build up this network, we, we build up the links for one formula, for one treatment option. We, we say it's, it's active here on the body system, on the organ level, on the cellular level, the subcellular level. Then, of course, the modern people say, ah, we very much rely on the genetic level. We very much rely on the cellular level. This is the so-called bottom-up approach. That we have all the bases, so many facts and figures are presented about this, uh, this part of biology. So how can we answer this from tradition? And this, I think, as we have a time-tested knowledge here, we say we start from top down. We tell you something from the time-tested uh, aspect of this formula of this medicine, which actually, of course, does not know anything about the genetics, does not know so much about the cellular level. But we can start from the systemic, the action on the body. Very often I hear it benefits the patient. If we are more specific, then we can talk about the organ level. We can talk about the <coughs> body as a whole. What is the action there? And this, combining this traditional time-tested top-down approach with the modern scientific bottom-up approach, maybe this could be a kind of a dialogue that could then help us really to bridge this uh, East and West, modern, traditional, Tibetan, and the rest of the world, maybe bring also Tibetan 
science together with the other traditional sciences because this is the level of linking that we we are definitely in Switzerland are working on this we uh, this is the aspect we we try to promote and which we try also to to make dialogues with the doctors of Western medicine in Switzerland I can tell you with this I think at least it was successful to make this kind of connections so we have um, actually good response of course there's much much more work to do I cannot say we did everything it's just an idea it's just preliminary ideas of course now if you would be here in a Western uh, scientific conference that would be what I talked now to you would have been my first five minutes and now I would have to present all the results all the details of the different levels this is actually the discussion that is going on there I would have to be much more specific especially on the findings on the subcellular level genetic level on the cellular level on the organ level but this is maybe not the topic of it today my colleague uh, Cecile, she will in the afternoon present some of the ideas and some of the results we have on the hidden fever, on the silent inflammation. Then you can see already some how this interlinks, how this is possible. And unfortunately, we don't hear Tenzin Chodo talking below of us. She's also talking about the anti cancer uh, activity of a certain formula. But in general, I think this is. For me, it's very encouraging. It's, this is the motivation of my work. Dialogue is possible, and I really enjoyed the dialogue with you. Um, and it's really this time-tested that we should not forget. This time, it is really generations tested it. And this is, especially for modern doctors, Western doctors, this is also a very important aspect because very often they see new drugs coming and going because of side effects, because companies don't uh, produce them anymore. The formulas of Tibetan medicine of the traditional systems are here for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that is a reason why they are here, because they were useful for generations. So we should also present this as a benefit. So this is a task for the future. It's not a, I did not present you the answer. I, I presented more or less a work program that we have to do where little of the work program we have already started. Maybe others have other ideas to contribute to this uh, concept, but that is basically where we are. And uh, it is possible, that's my message, to bridge the ancient wisdom and modern science. And so thank you that, uh, for the engagement that you have, the different institutions, uh, especially here at the university, the Central Council. Thank you for hosting this conference. Um, and at the end, I'm very happy that I had this lecture here today because today is my birthday, so it was very good. Uh, had a <laughs> Never had a birthday lecture, so <laughs> it's first time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the floor is open for the questions. <coughs> See, what about your uh, Switzerland laws? Ah, okay. About this uh, manufacturing or usage of these drugs? Yes, we only work with Tibetan formulas. Oh. And in fact, after 50 years of working with Tibetan medicine, I would I, I'm proud to say that Switzerland is now one of the few, maybe the only country in the world, which has recognized Tibetan formulas as part of their medical system. So the medical authority in Switzerland has a special provisions for Asian medicines, and within Asian medicine also recognizes Tibetan medicine. So when you see the annual report of the Swiss uh, medical authority, you see, okay, Tibetan medicine, I think at the moment we have four different products licensed. It's not so much, but when you see the work that it has to be done for registering Tibetan uh, formulas, it's a lot of work. It's a good beginning, yes.
So one more thing I want to make a clarification because uh, you have mentioned that the modern science is from the bottom up and our tradition is from the bottom down. Yes. And you said that uh, the molecules and cellular, our scientists, Asian scientists, they know about the cell, they know about the cell division. Everything is in recorded in olden literatures. So probably this modern scientist may not be aware of all these things. Even for example, I can say, in our Siddha system of medicine, <laughs> in this chapter under the embryology, they have mentioned about the first day how the embryo will be, second day how it will be, like that they have mentioned all these things. So cell, cell divisions and uh, union of the cells, it is not new to our ancient people. Yes. Probably they might have not recorded properly, but uh, the, our understanding is very pure, pure, poor, I can say. Yeah. That As a physicist, I don't want to argue here a lot about this, no, but, it's yeah, yeah, it's I know, I know that uh, on a... Arguments, the wisdom was there. Yes. Uh, Probably we may not be able to dig it down. May, there's one, one comment to this is, of course, in the tradition, there are many clairvoyant people have seen a lot of things. But science also puts beside the quality of things also a quantitative measure. And this, I think, maybe I did not uh, stress this too much, but science also means you have a number to everything. Size, weight, and so on. And this we need also to give. And this I mean also with this modern approach. So, of course, the ancient wisdom also brings some of the basic ideas, but these are qualitative concepts. I don't want to go deeper in it, but no, 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 to, yes, yes. I very much cherish this. Yes. Definitely, definitely. But, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to wish you happy birthday. Thank you. And uh, I'm a sovereign student, so I was, I'm always wondering uh, how can we uh, test the um, effectiveness of Tibetan medicine. So, but uh, you have already uh, uh, made this Padma 28 and it's already legal in Switzerland. Yeah. So you must have done some, some extensive uh, tests. Yes. Um, so yes. how did you test this? If you want to make a re uh, registration uh, in uh, a registration in Europe, you have to uh, prove the safety first and also the tradition, but then also the quality of the drugs. We heard this from Professor Katuch. It's sim pretty similar now in India. This uh, Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia uh, tells all that what is necessary. So it's the same with the European pharmacopoeia. That's the one part of it. And for the action, you need, if you want to understand the action, you need some biological models that have to. So. Uh, that's uh, a whole program that is going on there. So you have to make for registration, uh, I only can answer it now shortly. You have to go for the need for safety and quality. And the other, the third one is activity. These are the three things you have to look at. And all needs specific uh, science. And this is maybe the reason you as students of Sovarikpa. You have still, Sovarikpa is still in the idea that one doctor can do everything. In the West, science is a matter of specialization. You have pharmacists, you have chemists, you have medical doctors, and all those have to work together. And I think this is maybe also something you, in general, uh, Sovarikpa has to look at this kind of specialization. One person cannot know everything. This is very clear to us. So when we talk about this, this is a collaborative effect, uh, work. We work with the different sciences together, with the laboratory, with the production, raw materials, with uh, scientists of biology. And I think this is also one thing, that you learn to, to bring the knowledge together from different aspects so far. Very short answer. Any more questions? Uh, 
Thank you. So, uh, we would like to thank um, Dr. Harper Shawbul for highlighting the or giving some examples on the action profiles of sorric formulations in trying to bridge the gap between the traditional knowledge and ancient ancient knowledge and the modern science and making relevant for today's society. So I thank you audience for the participation. Thank you.